Um, so I'm James Ward. I'm a developer at Salesforce, and this is uh, Intro to Kafka. Um, so let's dive in. Oh, and uh, feel free to ask questions throughout the presentation. So don't we won't wait till the end. So uh, ask them anytime. All right. So sometimes this is kind of what our data integration feels like. It's uh, these rat's nests of wires, and you know I'm responsible for that one wire, and I've kind of lost track of like how it intertwines with all the different systems. And so this is what we're kind of, in a lot of enterprises, this is what things look like. And it's become a real challenge to move forward uh, as things have gotten more complex. So what is that complexity? What, is, uh, what are the reasons why we kind of got to these complex integration systems uh, that, we, that are kind of out of hand? So here are some challenges. Um, one is that we no longer really have a system of record for a lot of our data. If you just look at something like a contact object, uh, it could be that part of that comes in from a lead system, part comes from a customer portal, part comes from somewhere else, right? And so we're trying to like munch together all these different data sources for each application and the type of view that it needs of a particular piece of data. So that creates for some significant challenges, not having a single system or record anymore for a lot of our data. Uh, synchronization is hard. Uh, on my phone, uh, it can't even figure out how to synchronize email sometimes. And that's a pretty easy synchronization problem, or should be a pretty easy synchronization problem. So when we get into these deep graphs of data, uh, it becomes really, really complicated to do the synchronization, uh, really error prone. A lot of challenges around that. Then scaling our ETL has is, is been really hard. Uh, for a while, we tried to just put bigger machines at our ETL problems and hope that it could keep up with the amount of data that we are processing. Um, but we, what we really want to be able to do is scale our ETL processes horizontally. But most, uh, most of the time, we weren't able to do that for a variety of reasons. Then processing of this integration uh, data can be really error prone. There can be fields that we didn't expect to have the data that they had or not have the data that they had. Um, parsing is, can be really error prone. Uh, so um, these are some of the things that have kind of led us to that rat's nest of integration complexity. So what I want to talk about before we dive into Kafka is like, like, so how do we address some of these problems? And then of course, like how Kafka does it. So the first big thing that we're beginning to move to in these integration architectures is using events instead of tables as the source of truth for the state of a system. So you can see my <laughs> wonderful drawing there of an example of this where let's say we want to post to slash contact a REST API and then we want to do a put to do an update of the data. And so what we're going to do is we're going to feed those events sequentially through a thing and then from that thing, we can feed that data to other systems. So we can feed that data to a typical relational database that's going to turn those events into a create and an update and only keep track of the final state. Uh, or we're going to feed that data into some, uh, some process that's going to like do a count or so do some type of business analytics against those events. Uh, we could also hook this up to search indexers or to big data data stores or to whatever. But what we want to do is we want to look at the system of truth as being the actual events and keep those around. So when we take those events and we start keeping track of all of them and making that our source of truth, then what we, we, another thing that we need to be able to do is go back in time, rewind back so let's say that we turn off our processing because we're doing an update or there was a problem. We need to be able to go back in time to where we left off or maybe go reprocess some of these events. And so that, that thing needs to not just be an event stream where the events are flowing through, uh, but it also needs to be a ledger. And a ledger is something that we can go back in time uh, and, and get the old data from. So then the third way that we address some of these problems with our, with our integration architectures is that thing really needs to be distributed from the outset. It can't be something that we scale through adding uh, faster hardware to. It has to be something that we scale horizontally. 
So, of course, you probably guessed it, um, that thing is Kafka, and we'll talk about it in a second. But one of the things you might be wondering, looking at that, is, oh, that kind of looks like a messaging system. Like, we've been doing that with messaging systems. So why not messaging systems for this? Well, there's some issues with, with using messaging systems to, to address integration in those ways. First is ordering. Is ordering really guaranteed all the way to the consumption side in a message system? Maybe, maybe not. It's, uh, it's not always a guarantee that we can rely on. And it's pretty important to have ordering as a strict guarantee when we're relying on that event stream. If we get that create event after the update event, then that's not going to make any sense, right? And so we really need to make sure that ordering is guaranteed in our systems. Can we horizontally scale our messaging system? Maybe, maybe not. And uh, so that can be a challenge with how we scale our integration processes and all the things that hook onto it. Uh, is push the right way to do things? Um, might be, might not be, right? It's, uh, with push, we, we have some challenges. Like what if we have different speed consumers uh, and one consumer can process things really fast and one processes them really slow? How do we deal with those sorts of situations? Uh, how do we do back pressure, which is kind of the new uh, cool thing in reactive programming? How do we do back pressure with push? It's actually pretty hard. Pull uh, actually is a lot better way to, to apply back pressure to a system. So those are some of the, the reasons why um, a messaging system may not fit to be that, uh, that data store that we want. So let's talk about Kafka. So Kafka can be that thing. It uh, can be the, the kind of central hub of our integration architectures and other things where we can hook all these different systems, feed all those events in, and we can then hook different processes to them, different uh, data stores. So what Kafka actually is, is it's an event ledger. So it's a ledger, so it's keeping track of all the messages that come in. It's distributed by nature and it's redundant. So it's creating copies of these events as they go through the system. So sometimes you'll hear that in Kafka land called a distributed commit log. And uh, if we break that down, a log, you know, just like you have a log of stuff, you know, of events in the system, and then commit log, these are append only, we're writing to them, and then distributed across uh, multiple nodes and scaling horizontally. So uh, that all sounds great, but you know, does that distributed thing actually work? There's a lot of benchmarks out there around Kafka, and it does turn out that, yep, because of the architecture that they've used to implement the distribution, we do get linear scaling with Kafka. So as we add more loans, we, uh, more nodes, we linearly scale, scale that. And Kafka, because of some of the ways that it's implemented, we'll talk about in a few minutes, uh, we can get near network speeds of events processing through the system. Okay, so that's enough on the pitch of Kafka. Uh, let's dive into how to actually use it, what it actually is. So some of the fundamentals here are that Kafka uses messaging system semantics. So you, this will seem very similar to a messaging system, and that was intentional. They wanted it to seem approachable uh, for a lot of people, and most of us are familiar with messaging systems, so you'll see the same terminology used in Kafka as you'll see elsewhere, but there really is a completely different way that it's actually implemented underneath the covers. So you'll see producer, consumer, topic, those sorts of things. Uh, clustering is core in Kafka. You would never run a production Kafka instance with only one server. It, that just does not at all make sense in the Kafka world. It's really intended to be distributed horizontally across a bunch of different nodes. Um, so we'll talk about how, how the actual nodes come into play in a few minutes. And then Kafka has durability and ordering guarantees. So it's going to guarantee uh, durability based on either time or amount of data, and then it guarantees ordering. We'll talk about how it does that in a little bit. So that's kind of the, the core of what Kafka is all about, is those, those features. But what are some reasons that we would actually want to use Kafka? Uh, let's go through some of those. So first is modern ETL change data capture. So we can definitely use Kafka to be this hub, uh, this new like integration hub for all the data that's flowing through our systems. And we can hook ETL processes to those. We can uh, use that for change data capture. So that's one use case. 
Data pipelines is kind of the, the more modern use for Kafka and really kind of the, the use case that Kafka was created around was this idea that I'm going to have this hub and I'm going to hook all these things to the hub. So I'm going to hook my search indexer. I'm going to hook my machine learning processing. I'm going to hook my big data storage. Uh, I'm going to build everything off of this, this Kafka hub. So I've got lots of different producers feeding data into Kafka, and then I've got lots of different consumers that are doing all sorts of different things with the data. So that's the data pipelines use case. Another common use for Kafka is for big data um, ingest. So what we, um, a lot of times in our systems, we need something that can be a big buffer. So it can receive like trillions and trillions of events and be able to buffer that data because the downstream systems may not be able to keep up with the stream of data through the peak times. And so we want this buffer to be able to really quickly get that data, record that data, and then allow the systems behind it to, to catch up, uh, go back in time if they need to, those sorts of things. So those are our primary use cases for why we'd use it. So let me show you a quick little demo of a little Kafka app. Uh, and this is, this is kind of like a data pipelines application. So it'll give you an idea for some of the data pipeline stuff that we can do with Kafka. So um, first off, I'm running my Kafka server here. So it's running just on a single node. That's great for development, but again, don't ever do that in production. And so my Kafka server is up and running locally. And then I've got a Play Framework web application that is running and connected to that Kafka system. And then I'm also going to start up uh, just a console consumer, which will listen on a particular topic in Kafka for messages, and we'll see as those messages come through. So let's start up that, and we should start getting some, some messages coming through here in just a sec. OK, so let's go to our actual app now. So what I've done is tried to create a ride-sharing-like application where I've got a driver, and you'll see that it geolocated the driver there. And then what I can do is I can place a rider here on to, uh, onto the map somewhere. And the driver, if we go over to their screen, now sees that rider. And if we go back to here, we'll see that now I'm broadcasting these messages from the browser to my server and to Kafka, where it's saying, hey, I'm a rider. Right now we're listening to the rider's uh, feed of data. And it says, here's my Latin long, and here's my status is available. OK, so now as the driver, let's go select that rider. And we're using some cool map box technology here to, to figure out the route between the driver and the rider. And you'll see that now the driver is heading towards uh, that rider. Um, and what's really cool about this, which is some fun JavaScript to write, is it knows that the route will take four minutes. And that car will actually take four minutes to move along that route. So that was kind of fun. Um, OK, but then on the rider's view, we switch over and we see, sure enough, there's the, the driver headed towards me. OK, so all this data is flowing through Kafka in this case. And um, a more extended version of this demo, uh, I hook it up to Cassandra for the big data data store. So we're tracking all these events in Cassandra and have those there for, for querying and those sorts of things later. Uh, I'm also hooking it up to Flink for real-time analytics and all those sorts of things. But I wanted to just show you the basics uh, that was a little bit more than just a console log. Uh, Kafka and these, some of these server technologies are kind of challenging to demo because it's, you know, it's just text, right? How do you make text look interesting? So that's why I came up with that, that Kuber uh, little demo. Is there any UI for else? Is there any what is it? UI. UI. Uh, so yeah, so there is a UI that, that Confluent provides. It's like a management dashboard is one way you could do that. You could do the console uh, one as well. Um, I'll talk a little bit later about Heroku Kafka, which is Kafka in the cloud as a managed service. And they have a way to introspect the events through their UI as well. So, so really, anything can be a consumer. All that this command line is is a consumer on Kafka and then posting what it gets as messages out to the, the console. So you could make anything be a consumer to, to Kafka and get those events and visualize them. Yeah. OK, so that's my little Kuber app. And uh, just a fun way to show, OK, great. We hooked a driver UI and a writer UI together uh, through a message system uh, that was built in Kafka. OK, so it works. That's great. Let's, let's go on to some of what Kafka actually is. Um, 
and then we'll dive into the code behind that demo in a little bit. Okay, so the first uh, part of Kafka is records. Uh, you could also call these events or messages. Uh, so different terminology for the same thing. But what they are is a key, uh, a value, and a timestamp. Those are the pieces of a record. They're immutable. So once you create a record, you can't ever change it. So there's no like update operation in Kafka. There is basically only insert or append. And so once we create a record, it's written essentially forever with some caveats we'll talk about in a little bit. Append only. So we can only append events into the ledger. That's our only action. And then they are persisted. So they're actually persisted to disk. Uh, it's one of the cool features of Kafka is that it really uh, does a good job of optimizing um, uh, storage because in some messaging systems that have durability, they'll have a copy of the data in memory in the application and a copy of the data on disk. And Kafka says, let's just basically do everything against disk because disks have great caching now, or the operating systems have great caching around disks. So let's just use the disk, right? And so really the Kafka application is kind of almost a lightweight wrapper around just these operations writing to files on disk. Okay, so they're persisted. So we would also call this a log, right? The record part of this. So then we have producers and consumers. So um, we, uh, in Kafka, have brokers is the name for a node in the cluster. And a producer writes records to a broker. And then a consumer reads records from a broker. So this is actually an important thing because Kafka is not actually doing push. The consumer connects to a broker and asks for blocks of records, basically. We'll talk about how that works in a little bit. But it's not actually doing a push. The consumer is asking for records. So and then we use a leader follower for cluster distribution. We'll talk more about how that works in a little bit. So inside of Kafka, there is topics and partitions. So a topic is really just a logical name for one or more partitions. So in Kafka, we'll name a topic, like I have one in this application called writer, and then I can assign one or more partitions to that topic. So the partitions are what actually gets replicated. So the replication is not uh, really at the level of the topic, it's at the level of the partition. Then ordering is guaranteed only for a partition. So when I'm writing to that uh, writer or driver topic, uh, I'm writing to a particular partition within there, and my ordering is only guaranteed for that partition. If I do, uh, for some use cases, need ordering across the partitions, then I can use timestamps as a way to handle that. It gets a little bit tricky, like, what does a timestamp actually mean for my use case? Is it the time the event was generated? Is it the time it was received into Kafka? There's different times that you can associate with an event. But Kafka allows you, if you need to use timestamps, you can choose which one works for you. You can have Kafka automatically timestamp it when it's received. You can have, uh, or you can provide your own timestamps. So up to you. But ordering in terms of the sequentialness um, is, is guaranteed for a particular partition. OK. So then there's the offsets. And the offsets are uh, the way that we keep track of that ordering and, um, and deal with it. So there, the offset is what it's called in Kafka. is just the sequential ID that gets assigned as soon as I write a record to a partition. So whenever I do a write, it's going to say, OK, what's the next integer, essentially, or next long uh, to associate with that message? So you'll see that in a given topic, I'll have the same offset IDs uh, across my partitions. But I would never have uh, duplicate offsets within a given partition. So then it's uh, the consumer. Um, both Kafka and the consumer work together to keep track of these offsets. So when I'm a consumer, uh, I can ask Kafka and say, um, give me my offset. What is my offset? And if it's the first time I've ever connected to that topic, then it's going to say your offset is like zero, right? 
But if I disconnect and reconnect and I ask Kafka again, what's my offset? It's gonna, uh, there's a few different ways that we can tell it to um, which offset we should start from, which, or which one we left off at. Uh, so the consumer and Kafka work together to deal with these, and, and we'll talk more about um, mess, uh, the, the guarantees for delivery in a little bit for consumers. So, but some of the uh, benefits, which we've talked a little bit about for having these offsets IDs, is that we can replay, so we can always go back in time, uh, depending on our durability window, how long do we specify these events uh, will live, and that could be based on time, so it could be days, weeks, months, it could be basically infinity if you have enough disk space, uh, or it could be amount of, of storage that you're using. So you maybe want to say, uh, after a terabyte, then I want to start flushing out off the back of, uh, of this partition. Uh, so, the, and then, so one of the other benefits is now I can have my consumers at different places within uh, reading through the actual messages. So one consumer could be at offset Five, and another consumer could be all the way out, out at the head. Um, so that's how we support different speed consumers with Kafka. So those are our offsets. So let me zoom in a little bit to that one. So let's say that we have four brokers in our cluster and we have one topic. So that topic is then partitioned into four pieces. So here's how our, our actual partitioning works for, for message production. Um, so we're going to produce a message, and we produce a message to a given partition within a topic. So when we send a message, we're only going to send it to a given partition. So, you good? <laughs> uh, so um, what that means is that we're going to write to a leader of a partition. So remember, there's a leader follower architecture in Kafka. So when we write, we're writing, always writing to the leader of a partition. So that's an elected leader. Um, I won't go into the details of how leader election works and stuff, but we write to the leader, and then what happens is that there are followers that will then replicate that data out to other nodes. Uh, and then we can do this partitioning based on, uh, we can either do it manually, so that would be actually like giving, telling it which number partition we want to use, or we can partition based on a key as well and let Kafka handle the actual partitioning for us. So what we're setting when we set up a, a topic is we set the replication factor. In this case, our replication factor would be three, which is saying, okay, we have three copies of the data, and then one of those is gonna always be the leader. So in this case, we would have our four partitions, each would have its two replica and be, uh, be scaled across the cluster of machines. So Kafka will take care of auto rebalancing the partitions across all the nodes in the cluster. Okay, so then, um, oh, and uh, by default, when you, if you just produce a message to a topic, it's essentially doing some kind of round robin across the partition. So you can definitely use, uh, do message production without doing any partitioning, and in that case, Kafka is gonna do the partitioning automatically for you. Or you can do it manually, specify the actual like number of the partition or based on key. Okay, so then uh, consumer groups are how we do scale out of um, partitioning, dealing with partitions uh, on the consumer side. So uh, I've got my partitions, right? And I've got a, a group of nodes that's all going to be consuming data from a topic. But I really don't want, if I have, let's say, two nodes, and I get a message into partition zero on server one, I don't want that message to be delivered to both nodes that are processing the same data. I want to have the scale out so that I can add a bunch of nodes to do processing in parallel, but I, I really don't, across what we call a consumer group, I really don't want to have that message delivered multiple times to multiple uh, nodes within my consumer group. So Kafka takes care of that for us through consumer groups. So really what a consumer group is, is this logical name from one or more consumers, and the message consumption is then load balanced across the different consumers within consumer nodes within a consumer group. Okay, so that's how we do the uh, partitioning on both the production side and on the consumption side. So now here's the fun part. Let's talk about message uh, delivery guarantees. So with Kafka, um, we uh, have different ways to look at, at delivery guarantees. Uh, before we go into that, any questions about the, the production or 
uh, consumption partitioning. I know that gets kind of tricky. Yep. How do you the yeah. Yeah, good question. So um, the followers are really just there in case our leader node goes down. Then the cluster will re-elect a new leader within, within the cluster. And then once we bring up a new node to replace that one, actually, we don't even need to bring up a new node, Kafka will automatically see that, OK, my replication factor is 3. I've lost a node. So any of the partitions that were on that node now need to be set up on, on a new node. And so Kafka will automatically manage that for us. But, but so we always have a leader of a partition. Our production and consumption is always against the leader. And the, uh, the replica are really just there in case a node goes down. So that we have the data basically hot standby. We can flip, over to, we can flip the leader over to that one in the case that a node goes down. So they're just there for, for that use. Yep. It is, yeah. So there's. There's a, uh, a bunch of different configuration options for how to do that, but yeah, they are doing a, a quorum. Uh, it's, it's like a modified quorum algorithm for, uh, for that. Yeah, yeah so uh, good point, thank you. So the, the whole cluster is using Zookeeper to actually keep track of the state of the cluster. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about message guarantees. So, um, there's guarantees, different guarantees on both the production side and on the consumption side. So let's talk through each of those. So for producing messages to Kafka, the, uh, the default way is just to say async. So with async, there is no delivery guarantee. I have no guarantee that Kafka actually received and, and recorded a record when I send it. So for performance, that's going to be the best, right? That's going to be the highest performance. No acknowledgment of it being received. The next thing uh, setting we can tweak is to say, OK, I want to not actually acknowledge that the message was received, or I, wanna, I do want to receive acknowledgment that the message was received from just the leader. And not just received, but actually committed to the file that's underneath Kafka. So that's the next option. And then the following one is I want to guarantee that it's not just received by the leader, but has also been received by a quorum of the followers of that data. So if you really need to make sure you're not going to lose any data, then you'd want to go with that third option. So this certainly d depends on your use case. And so you can always, uh, this is just when you produce messages, you can change this setting to fit your use case. So in the case of like IoT sensor data that you're getting every half second or something, you can probably just go async. And you know if you lose some messages, that's OK, right? Uh, but if you're doing like financial transactions, then you probably want to go with the third option, where we really make sure that that data has been committed to the leader in the quorum. OK, questions about production, uh, the producer delivery guarantees. Yeah. Uh, they, there are some, some blog posts and some information in the documentation on, on the different trade-offs. Obviously, there is a trade-off, right? With each of these, there's like orders of magnitude higher latency. So with async, it's you know, network speeds, basically. Uh, with the next one, I have to actually receive and write it to disk. So I don't know what the actual numbers are, but however long it takes to receive and then write it to the disk. And then the quorum one, it depends on the topology of my network. So if I need to wait for a quorum of my nodes to actually do the write, then if I've got high latency between my nodes, or between maybe some portion of my nodes, then that could, could have a pretty dramatic impact. So the third one is really based on network topology. Second one is probably based on uh, how saturated my, my node is, um, and, uh, and then disk speed. And then the first one is, you know, yeah, yeah. So you can pull up all the the diagnostic information on this through the the Confluent console. Yeah. Any other questions on that? Okay. So let's go on to the consumer guarantees. So this is where it gets pretty fun because this is what most people are interested in is on the consumer side what happens. So uh, the default is at least once. So the way that that works is remember the the offset ID. And Kafka is keeping track of where my consumer is in reading through its offsets. So the default is that uh, I'm, as a consumer, going to ask Kafka for a block of offsets. And 
I, Kafka is going to wait and record that offset, the final offset that I got to, until I've actually told Kafka, hey, I got through all those records, right? So this is at least once because if processing fails midway through that, then Kafka only knows that I started at the beginning. It doesn't know how far I got through that block of records. So then it's going to then re potentially re-deliver some of those messages. So that's the, the default. The next option is at most once. And in that case, what we do is when we ask Kafka for that block, we like right at the beginning say, OK, I got all those records. And so what that's saying is that, all right, if next time I, if something fails halfway through, then Kafka is saying, OK, I'm just assuming you told me you got through all those records. So that's why it's at most once. So those are the two easiest. And then uh, what most people really want, um, we'll talk about in a second, but what most people get to and use is effectively once. Um, so with effectively once, we're doing uh, at least once delivery but then we have some way to make sure that we're not going to reprocess uh, that data in a way that, that um, would, be, would alter the state you know, by, re by processing the same record more than once. So easy ways to do that is that if you have an item potent service, then that's, you know, so it's not actually mutating any state or we can use a, a unique ID for this event then we can basically guarantee that, OK, we've already seen this ID. We've already recorded it. Or maybe we re-recorded it, but it's not going to actually change the state again. Uh, then we can get effectively once processing. So that's pretty common in our systems is to, to do effectively once. Now, exactly once is what everyone like says that they want. But most people now agree that you can't really do uh, exactly once processing. It's basically impossible. There is a way to do it uh, in Kafka. So with Kafka, you can keep track of your consumer uh, or of your offset. So if you're keeping track of your offset, then what you can do if you really, really, really want exactly once, and let's say you have a transactional database system. So what you could do is take that offset and you could put it into the same transaction as, your as the data that you're processing. And so if the transaction fails, then the, re the recording of where I am in the stream, or what my offset is, is also not going to be updated. right? So if you can roll all that stuff into one transaction, then yeah, you could, you could potentially do exactly once delivery. Um, and this is true not just of Kafka, but of any, any type of system that does message delivery. Uh, exactly once is really hard unless you have this transactional system that you can do it against. Uh, but at least with Kafka, you do have that concept of that offset ID where you can keep track of how far you got through processing. OK, questions on that one? OK. So I wanted to highlight some of the, the cool features of Kafka. Let me check my time. Okay. Some of the cool features of Kafka, and then we'll, we'll dive into some code. So log compaction is one thing that Kafka does that's really nice. So uh, if I, in my, my case, if we look back at my data here, my, my writer has been picked up, and it, my writer's lat lawn isn't changing. right? And so it would sure be nice, like as this data is streaming in, I'm writing every single one of these to Kafka. But wouldn't it be nice to not chew through all that disk space uh, if they're just duplicate records? And so with Kafka, we can do log compaction. And how that works is that there's, there's kind of like a sweeper that's coming behind the, the, uh, at the end of the log file if you've turned on log compaction. It's an option. And it'll come through, and it'll sweep through and compact down uh, similar the records with the same key down into a single record. So it's just preserving disk space is ultimately what's happening. So we do then have gaps in our offset IDs in this case, but Kafka deals with that. So if you ask for an offset ID that has been compacted, it's going to choose the one that it was compacted into because uh, these are just sequential IDs. Yeah? It does, yeah. So, so this is. It's essentially a background process that's running on your files that is doing this, this sweeping from the backside. It doesn't impact your, it doesn't directly impact your production or consumption because that's all working like off the front of the file, whereas this is working off the back of the file. So it's just going to be more disk read and write overhead essentially on your nodes. 
So, yep, there is a trade-off to it for sure. So it depends, like, you know, what does my data look like? Uh, do I really want to compact down these records so that they're the same uh, to save disk space? Or, you know, if you're not dealing with, like, IoT streams of data, like, you may not even need to turn that on. So it, it uses the key of the record. So if there are sequential records that have the same key, that's what gets compacted down into a single record. So the values could actually be different. This is, uh, I think you can override this behavior with settings, but I think the default is, is if the key is the same, compact it down if they're sequential. And it doesn't matter what the, what the actual uh, value is. Okay, so I mentioned this earlier, but disk not heap. So a lot of uh, messaging systems that do any kind of durability, they basically have two copies of the data, the one in memory that they're working on, and then the one on disk that's there, you know, in case things die. And what Kafka does is it just uses the disk. And their kind of, I think, revelation around this was that operating systems are already keeping a cache of disk reads. And so why have two caches of that? Right? You can have the disk cache that your operating system is doing, and then you can have the cache and memory in your application. And Kafka said, let's just basically use the disk cache. Like once these reads are in uh, the operating system read cache, then they're super fast, and why replicate those into memory in my JVM? So it really uses the disk, not the heap, to, to be much more efficient, and uses the operating system disk caching uh, to be efficient about that. So another cool feature here is page cache to socket. This is a, a modern, I think it started on Linux, maybe Solaris or something, but uh, is this optimization where you can have this really fast pipeline of data from, from disk to a network socket. So instead of always going through Kafka, in the case of like replicating data to other nodes, it doesn't necessarily have to go through the JVM process. It can basically just take a chunk of, of disk memory and pipe that directly to network. So really nice efficiency for how it actually moves the data uh, through the network. There are certainly times where it does need to go uh, be read into Kafka, uh, but, but for some use cases like replication, it doesn't need to. You can just copy straight from disk to the network socket super efficiently. So then balanced partitions uh, and leaders. So Kafka is, is always kind of keeping track of the state of the cluster and doing uh, this rebalancing of, of the leaders. So remember there, for each partition, there was a leader that was elected. And it could be the node is starting to get kind of overwhelmed with uh, the number of messages that are coming into it. Uh, and that may be because, you know, one, partition is really noisy and another one isn't as noisy. So maybe we should move the less noisy one over to a different node so that its performance isn't degraded because of that one partition. So Kafka will do that automatic rebalancing uh, for us and will automatically rebalance the leaders as well. Because we have these replica of the data, we can essentially at any point in time elect a new leader of a partition. And then all of a sudden the, the, uh, the producers and consumers for that partition will con connect to the new node automatically. So the Kafka client is using Zookeeper to understand, to get events on like, okay, a new leader has been elected, now connect to that new leader. That's all happening under the covers for us. So one of the challenges that we may have is uh, a particular producer or consumer may just like totally saturate a node. And if, uh, if that's happening, we may want to put some quotas around like, okay, how, much, how many events per second can a particular producer or consumer work with so that we don't sat fully saturate nodes in the cluster. So that's a nice feature. So then another nice feature, Heroku Kafka. Uh, I work at Salesforce and we provide a service through Heroku for Heroku Kafka. So that's how I got into Kafka was like, I didn't want to set up and manage the Zookeeper clusters and the Kafka clusters. Uh, I just let Heroku do that. And so now I can just use Kafka and not have to worry about the management of it. So pretty, pretty nice uh, thing there. Okay, so let's talk about the clients for Kafka. So the JVM is the official one and that's because Kafka is built on the JVM. Uh, but then there are other clients for really anything you can imagine at this point. So you can definitely find, find a client out there for Kafka for whatever you're using. 
as I've talked about, the clients are polling based on the consumption side, which is pretty different than, than most uh, typical messaging system consumers. So the API for Kafka is really pretty basic. This is the, the raw kind of basic API of Kafka is I have a producer that sends data, and then I have a consumer that can fetch the offsets, um, uh, can fetch the offsets for a uh, given partition, and can fetch the records uh, based on the offsets. So really simple API underneath it all. Um, but what I prefer to use with Kafka is something called Aka Streams. And uh, so I'll give a quick little overview of Aka Streams so that some of the code I'll show you in a minute will make some sense. But uh, what Aka Streams is, is it's an implementation of reactive streams. So if you've heard of uh, Rx Java or Aka Streams, or there's a number of other implementations out there. Uh, there's a standard that a bunch of different vendors work together to create, and then there's implementations of this thing called reactive streams. So what it is is source sync uh, stream processing, stream programming. So a source is something that produces events, and then the sync is something that consumes the events. So one of the really nice features of reactive streams and of Aka streams is this idea of back pressure, that a, cu a, a consumer can actually put back pressure back on the producer so that the producer can, we can basically tell the producer, hey, slow down, uh, I'm not ready for more records, and that can make our systems more resilient um, and can uh, help us deal with, uh, ultimately deal with spikes in, in things much better. So that's built into Aka Streams and Reactive Streams. So what I'm using is something called Reactive Kafka, which is an Aka Streams implementation or wrapper around the Kafka client. So it has the back pressure, it has uh, the source and sync for Aka Streams that hook to Kafka. So it's pretty nice. Um, Aka Streams, uh, pretty simple API uh, when we start with, with the, the basic stuff. So I can create a source. In this case, I'm just going to repeat hello world. And then I can have a sync, which in this case just prints out whatever the sync gets. And then I create a flow, which links together a source and a sync. I can chain syncs together. I can combine sources, all sorts of different things. But then when I run this flow, it's just going to continually repeat out hello world. So in this case, no back pressure, no fancy stuff, just a basic example. OK, so that's our quick little intro to Aka Stream. So let's go take a look at some of the code here for, um, for the, the Kuber demo. Oh, and I should put this up real quick. All the code for this is on uh, my GitHub, and it's called Kuber for Kafka Uber. <laughs> um, creative. I'm a creative one. <laughs> OK. so. Um, in my code, I have this Kafka helper. And we need to provide Kafka with a serializer and a deserializer. So the serializer for writing records, uh, deserializer for reading records. And we need to do it both for the key and for the value. So in this case, I'm using JSON for my serialization. You probably wouldn't want to do that in the real world because JSON is pretty heavy. Uh, there are some better options like Avro, uh, Protobufs, um, something more compact and, and ultimately much more performant is what you really want to get to with Kafka. JSON, is, JSON serialization is really slow. So for the type of volume that we deal with in Kafka usually, we, we don't want to use text-based serialization. So, um, but for this demo, it works really well. OK, so I've got my serializer and deserializer. Also, I have uh, some stuff that helps me connect to Kafka, because um, uh, in this case, I'm using SSL certificates, and so I have to deal with some of the, the stuff there for that. OK, but then, yeah, go ahead. That's right. So, so I would recommend that in production, you, you may want to use SSL. Um, on Heroku, you have to use SSL. And so that's, that was what that code was doing was specific. When I'm working locally, I'm actually not using SSL. But when I'm running on Heroku, I do use SSL. So that was just some plumbing to set up the SSL connections and deal with the certificates and that sort of stuff. Yeah, thanks. OK, so now I've got my little Kafka class here. And this is Scala code, so sorry if it's uh, I'll try to, to walk through it uh, for those of you that, that aren't familiar with Scala. But I create my producer settings and my consumer settings. And these are ultimately just, just configuring for, uh, for a given producer and consumer, what are my serializers and deserializers. 
And then there's one other little thing here. Oh, and what server to connect to. And then one other thing here on the consumer side is my group ID. So remember my consumer group uh, is a group of nodes that's going to uh, make sure that we're only, only one node in the consumer group is going to get delivered that, uh, a message. So that's what the consumer group is doing, is grouping nodes. In this case, I only have one node, so I'm just generating a random UUID as my consumer group. OK. So then I've got my sync. And this is where I'm actually using uh, that reactive Kafka library. And I create a plain sync, um, which is my sync is going to be the way that I get messages into Kafka. So I'm going to send a message to a sync, and then reactive Kafka will send that actually to Kafka. And then my source takes a topic, and then what it does is it subscribes two messages on that topic from Kafka. So I've got my sync and my source, and that's how I communicate with, uh, with Kafka. So now here's where the part that kind of pulls it all together is I have uh, two WebSockets. So the driver UI has, one, uh, has a WebSocket. The writer UI has a WebSocket. And what I'm doing is just wiring together these two different messages, message feeds. So on the writer, I'm broadcasting messages about my writer position. So this guy, right, he's broadcasting his position and his status. So that's the writer topic. And then the driver is broadcasting its position, right? And so what I need to do is the driver needs to broadcast its position, but then receive the writer information, and then the opposite, right? And so what I do is I set my sync as being uh, the, um, uh, in this case, this is the driver WebSocket. So I want to produce messages to the driver topic in Kafka. And then I want to read messages from the writer topic in Kafka. So that's my source. And then I set up my WebSocket with a flow that links together the sync and the source. So that's what ultimately drives the, that two-way communication across that WebSocket. OK, so pretty simple to kind of wire together those things. But let me show you one other quick thing here. If you dive into the, the Kuber code, there's a whole lot more here. There's connecting to this uh, Kafka to Cassandra. But then I, I think the Flink one is pretty cool. So Flink is this great uh, real-time stream processing um, engine. Uh, it's open source at Apache. And it has out-of-the-box support for Kafka. So in this case, what I want to do is I want to keep track of what's my average wait time that someone is waiting for the car to get to them. And I want to just keep a rolling average. So what I do in here is this is a little Flink uh, client app where I'm uh, subscribing to the driver topic. And then I'm just keeping track of my route totals. So how many, how many routes, which is a connection between a driver and a rider, how many routes have I had, and then what's the total number of seconds. And, so I'm, and then I can calculate my average from that. So what I do is I take my stream from Kafka. I do a little bit of parsing and uh, partitioning of that. And then I do a fold on that. So the cool thing about Flink is that I can run this on a bunch of different nodes. And it's using some of those features of Kafka with the consumer groups to actually do a fold, which is a aggregation uh, computation across all these events. Um, and in this case, I haven't done any windowing in Flink, like I could do time-based windowing or number of records-based windowing, those sorts of things. In this case, it's actually just recalculating every single time an event comes in. So probably not what I'd want in a real, real world case, but, but that's it. And then uh, if we run this, it's just going to print out the average every single time a, a record comes in. So, so Flink is pretty cool stuff. Um, sorry, I didn't have enough time to go into that. Didn't plan on that today because uh, it, it takes a bit longer to go through the Flink stuff. But, but you can go check out the code on my GitHub and go explore all that. OK, so that's your quick intro to Kafka in high speed. Uh, uh, I think we're, we're just about out of time, but if there's any last questions, feel free to throw them out. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, good question. So you can download uh, you can download Kafka like as a zip file, and you can start up your your Kafka server locally. What I actually did in the case of this Kuber app is I just uh, because Kafka is just some jar files in Maven Central, I just set depend set dependencies on Kafka, and then I start up the Kafka process as part of my build, so that you don't I don't have to tell the when you go clone the Kuber repo. You just run the build and, and can start the Kafka cluster from there, and it downloads everything it needs. So the other option would be download their zip file, un extract it, start up the server, and 
you know, do it that way. But if you go to the Kuber repo, you'll see all the instructions for how to, how to get started in the Kuber way. <laughs> yeah, cool. OK, I'm going to wrap up so uh, the next speaker can get set up. But I'll be around if anybody has any questions. So thanks. Uh, thanks for having me. Hope that was useful. Thanks.